Ahoy thar, mateys, and welcome to Distillations, extracts from the past, present, and future of Kemarstri. <clears throat> I'm Mayor Rindy, and I've been practicing for International Talk Like a Pirate Day, which happens every year on September 19th. Arr, arr, arr. All right, well, you get the idea. This week, we're putting aside the modern, romanticized version of the pirate and focusing on the evidence they and other salty dogs have left behind. Shipwrecks, how they are preserved, and what they can tell us. It's deep sea chemistry, coming up on today's episode of Distillations. On land, the corrosion of time leaves historians and archaeologists with only scraps of papyrus or nubs of primitive tools. But underwater, a well-preserved ship is, well, buried treasure. Just recently, a 2,000-year-old Roman ship was discovered off the coast of Italy in such good condition that its food stores are still intact. Classical scholars, of course, are salivating. Scientists, too. Australian chemist Ian McLeod specializes in studying marine corrosion on ships like this one. He spent his career working on historic shipwreck sites around the globe and says the key to a ship's survival under sea is oxygen. Diane Hope produced this story. Tumbling, surf-rich environments basically eat cast iron for breakfast. A constant barrage of oxygenated water is the driving force for decay. My name is Ian McLeod and I'm director of the Maritime Museum in Fremantle in Western Australia. I trained as a chemist and I dive on shipwrecks studying the corrosion and the decay on historic shipwreck sites. When you've got a vessel that came to grief in just a few metres of water. You have to work in that environment. In between waves, you can begin taking your measurements. Bit of a heavy wave breaks on top of you. Then you just get shoved the length of a baseball field in a matter of a few seconds. And then as the wave passes, it sucks you back to where you were working and you just sort of shake your head and carry on. The principal enemies of shipwrecks are time and the amount of oxygen in the seawater because it's oxygen that provides the energy to corrode. And also oxygen provides the life force for bacteria and the other marine organisms that eat timber and also create microbiological decay of metals. The oldest shipwrecks in the world are made of wood and one of the most famous of all time is Henry VIII's flagship, the Mary Rose, which sank in Portsmouth Harbour in 1545. And the reason why approximately a third of the ship was preserved was because it was buried under very, very fine silt. And that burial environment was so good that you could restring English bows from the 16th century and fire arrows from them. I mean, absolutely extraordinary preservation can be achieved in cold, dark, anaerobic waters. It was really round about the turn of the middle of the 19th century when iron ships came to the fore and I've spent the last 33 years getting to know the way in which metals corrode and decay. The main factor controlling the decay on shipwreck sites is in fact called the flux of dissolved oxygen. So it's not just the analytical concentration of oxygen in the seawater, it's the rate at which that oxygen is brought to the surface of the objects and you can see the effects of it very clearly in the voltage that the metals have. During an analysis of a shipwreck, we have a voltmeter, which tells us the voltage between a reference electrode and the corroding metal. 
and we also take down a pH meter which measures the acidity or the alkalinity of the environment. We also have to take down an underwater drill so that we can drill through the marine growth and get in contact with the metal and once we've got all those parameters together we can build up a picture of how fast the object is corroding. Metals give you negative numbers in the marine environment. On a nicely preserved iron wreck, you might have a voltage of say minus 650 millivolts. And on a very badly corroded bit of cast iron, it might be minus 120 millivolts. One of the most exciting wrecks I've worked on is the wreck of the San Pedro de Alcantara of Portugal. It gave me my first underwater experience of gold. Hidden underneath some rocks was a coin. And instead of being negative, it was a positive voltage. And the only thing that could give you a positive voltage was a gold coin, just sitting there as an inert metal and just watching the oxygen flow by. I didn't care about the waves trying to smash us against the cliffs because I'd got the result that I'd always dreamed of finding. I was laughing. I was laughing underwater and my colleague, he could see my bubbles and the smile behind my face mask and we had a good bottle of wine to celebrate that night when we got home. Chemistry changes with temperature. So for example, in shallow warm waters, it's very easy for calcium carbonate to precipitate out. And that's why your coral reefs easily grow in warm, shallow, tropical waters, because it's a very low energy process to make their skeletons. But as you get colder, it requires more and more energy to push minerals out of the seawater. And so, although the amount of oxygen decreases with depth, it's still enough to corrode the metals. And so you get the situations like on the Titanic wreck site that although it's 36, 38 Fahrenheit, there's still enough oxygen to corrode the metal. And it's got no protective blanket from marine growth. And that's why you get those rusticles growing which is just precipitated iron corrosion products as the wreck begins to decay. One of the most moving wrecks I've worked on is the remains of the USS Arizona in Pearl Harbor. Because there were so many thousands of sailors killed on that wreck, the whole site is in fact a war grave. But when you go diving down through the murky waters, you see appearing in front of you these giant four barrels and they are so big, I could stick and I did. I stuck my head inside one of those gun barrels and it easily fitted. One of the main concerns about the Arizona wreck is that when it sank, there was a lot of unused fuel on board and they need to know for pollution management how much more time they've got to have safe containment. We've been able to model the corrosion behavior of iron wrecks. So with a team from the National Institute of Scientific Measurements and the National Parks, we can tell you exactly how many more years it will be before the stern begins to fall apart. And so they have a plan for the next 250 years of how to manage that memorial. There will still be significant bits of the Arizona around when who knows what will remain standing in our great cities. Ian McLeod is a corrosion chemist and the director of Western Australia's Maritime Museum in Fremantle. This piece was created by Arizona-based sound recordist and audio producer Diane Ho. By land or by sea, if you have something to say about this or any other episode of our show, send an email to distillations at chemheritage.org. I'm Mayor Rindy.
chemistry can tell us how the contents of a sunken ship may fare against oxygen, sodium, and sulfur. And when preserved, those contents can tell us about the time they came from, about trade and war and power, who our ancestors were and how they lived. Michal Meyer has more. Globalization is a modern word, and we assume that the PCs, Nikes, clothes, and foodstuffs that crisscross the world are part of a very modern phenomenon. But ancient civilizations had their own form of globalization. Fragile wooden cargo ships assailed the then known world, filled with the common and high tech goods of the day. These ships, by our standards, were little more than leaky wooden tubs and often came to grief in storms or on reefs. Now they are time capsules. One of the most famous of these sunken treasures was found in the early 1980s in the Mediterranean Sea, just off the south coast of Turkey. A local man was diving for sponges when he came across a copper ingot. Archaeologists explored the spot and found the remains of a ship and its cargo. After careful study, they determined the ship to be more than 3,000 years old, dating back to the Bronze Age. Even more interesting, they found the contents of the ship came from all over the Mediterranean region. The copper ingots could be traced to a mine on the island of Cyprus. Within the hull, they found firewood, which was carbon dated to the 14th century BCE. They found jewelry from Egypt, one piece even engraved with the name Queen Nefertiti. They found terebinth resin from the west of the Dead Sea, used to make turpentine. They found pottery jars from what is now Israel or Syria, and ivory, ebony, and ostrich shells from Africa. Further south, in the Sea of Galilee, another discovery brought history to life. In 1985, the Sea of Galilee was shrinking from a hard drought and the overpumping of its water reserves. That winter, Two brothers who lived on a kibbutz beside the lake went hunting for wrecks on the newly exposed lake bed. They found the remains of a wooden plank. Underneath lay part of a boat, protected by sediment. It wasn't much from which to recreate an era, but archaeologists soon found bits of pottery, an oil lamp, and some coins. Carbon dating of the wood placed the boat between 100 BCE and 67 CE, a span that covers both the life of Jesus and the beginnings of the first Jewish revolt against the Roman Empire. The Far East, too, has its share of underwater time capsules. In 1998, a diver searching for sea cucumbers found a wreck off the island of Sumatra. Archaeologists placed it in the 9th century when an Arab ship must have hit a reef off Sumatra in what is now Indonesia and sank to the silty sea floor. The ship was filled with gold and silver objects, spices, bronze mirrors, and 60,000 Chinese bowls and cups. While the Silk Road is famed in history as an overland trade route, this wreck was the first real proof of a sea trade between two superpowers of the time, Baghdad and Tang Dynasty, China. The sheer number of ceramics found on the boat indicates a booming Chinese export economy and a China open to the world. That changed in the 15th century when China began to turn inward. Within 200 years, European fleets dominated the world sea trade. But the proof of China's place in the ancient seas remains. As researchers continue to explore the seas, countless other historical truths may be revealed. For Distillations, I'm Michal Meyer. Michal Meyer is Distillations' associate producer. And that's it for this week's show. Distillations is a presentation of the Chemical Heritage Foundation. Our show is produced by Mia Lobel, Jennifer Dionisio, Anne Fredrickson, and Michal Meyer. Our theme music is composed and performed by Andrew Chalfin. Additional music provided by Music Alley and the Free Music Archive. 
Tell us what you think about the program, suggest ideas for future shows, or share your favorite sea shanty at distillations at chemheritage.org. Until next time, I'm Mayor Rindy. Arrgh.